Good morning. It is so good to be with you again and to worship and to proclaim the Word of God. Uh, Pastor Daniel will be coming in just a few minutes to conclude our series, Remember, as we see Peter remind the believers that the persecution and adversity that they are facing is only temporary. Jesus has promised to return and to complete all that he has begun for his kingdom. So this morning, this is our great anticipation, our Lord's glorious return when he will reign and have total rule and glory. Now, as we prepare for worship, uh, please do not forget that we have our Canaan STL app where you can connect with us and access today's message. Uh, you can also access this through our website. And if you are watching this on YouTube, you will find a link uh, to our website in the description below. Now, I have a couple of things for you to remember to put on your calendar. Uh, first, we have our church business meeting, which will be coming up today at 4 p.m. So please join us this afternoon on Zoom or over the phone. Uh, check your email as the link uh, for this was sent out over the weekend. Secondly, we are excited to reopen our building and, and gather together again in person to worship our Lord. So next uh, Sunday, May 24th, at 10.30 a.m., we are going to begin this reopening process at 25% capacity. Uh, we are going to be spread out throughout the worship center and then have overflow into the gymnasium. So please watch your email this week where you will be able to RSVP uh, to help prepare a space for you and your family. All right, as we now uh, go into a time of worship, I just want to uh, read some uh, verses to you from Psalm 95. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us worship together.
Well, good morning, Canaan. Uh, good to be back together online once again. I hope everyone had a, had a great week and a great Mother's Day last Sunday. And uh, it was fun for us to try our first ever drive-in service. Uh, but today we're back online, and uh, we are looking at next Sunday being back on location, back in our building at 25% capacity. So already there's been some talk about that. You'll be getting a lot more information coming uh, this week as we look to begin reopening next Sunday. How, how exciting. We've been waiting, I'll pray for this time for quite a while now, but uh, we're going to do it very carefully, strategically, but also we, we're just going to be glad to get everybody, uh, at least most of you, uh, back in the building to worship together. Well, today we are going to be finishing up our series on First Peter, uh, looking at Remember. And uh, as we've been journeying through First Peter, with the exception of last week, we kind of took a break for Mother's Day. But just looking at Peter's message to the believers of his day, who were undergoing intense suffering, intense persecution at the hand of, a, of an evil uh, emperor named Nero, who was very oppressive and persecuting of the believers. And so they were, they were suffering. They, they had church members and loved ones and family members who were captured and tortured, even executed because of their faith. And so Peter's letter to them is all about how do we, as believers, how do we persevere victoriously through seasons of suffering? 
And so it's just been, you know, very timely for us as we uh, are just looking at our, our pandemic. And uh, again, hopefully we're, we're on the, the, the way out of that. But uh, today, if you have your Bible, just go to 1 Peter. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 4. We're going to cover the last part of chapter 4 and the first part of chapter 5. Uh, as we look at today's remembrance, remember the Lord's promise. So, so far in our series, we looked at, you know, remember, remember your salvation. That was chapter 1. Uh, just the power that we have as we remember that we are saved, that we are born again. Remember that all that has gone into us being saved, forgiven, cleansed, guaranteed everlasting life, purpose now for living, all that goes into the power of the gospel in our lives, when we remember and stay focused on our salvation, it helps us to persevere victoriously no matter what may come our way. And then the second week, we looked at remember your calling. You know, Jesus, he doesn't just save us just so we can have everlasting life. There's a lot more to it than that. We are saved for purpose here and now. And to, we're to live that calling out as, as his representatives here in our world, in, in our communities, in our families, in our neighborhoods. And so when we remember our calling, it helps us to stay focused even in those times of suffering. And then part three we looked at two weeks ago was remember our Savior. Remember Jesus and Jesus, how he exemplified uh, for us what it is to suffer for the glory of God. It says things like, you know, Peter says, when even though he was reviled, he did not revile in return. It talks about how Jesus is the chief cornerstone, how by us remembering our Savior, he's the cornerstone. Everything just fits together in him. And so that's helpful in us being able to victoriously persevere and thrive uh, through times of suffering. Well, today we're going to end up with Peter's last thought of remembrance, and that is remember the Lord's promise. And specifically, he's talking about remember the Lord's promise to return. And so today we're going to be looking at the Lord's promise. So the big thought this morning as we uh, complete First Peter is that the fourth key to living victoriously through times of suffering is to remember the Lord's promise to return. And here specifically, you know, we're looking at his, his, the second coming of Christ. And so let's read together uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to start with verse 7. And uh, just for now, I'm going to just read through the end of chapter 4. And then later on, we'll actually get into chapter 5 a little bit. So uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Now the end of all things is near. So therefore, be serious and disciplined for prayer. Above all, maintain an intense love for each other, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks of God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength that God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you, as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of the Messiah, so that you may also rejoice with great joy at the revelation of his glory. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. None of you, however, should suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he should not be ashamed, but should glorify God in having that name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So those who suffer according to God's will should while doing what is good, entrust themselves to a faithful creator. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to this time of just examining your text and hearing from you through your word, Lord, I pray that you would just, uh, first of all, just fill me with your spirit, fresh and anew. God, I just pray that you just communicate through this text and me clearly, God, in a way that um, moves all of us to have greater faith in you, a greater hope and anticipation of your return. And God, maybe a greater resolve to persevere victoriously through this time. So Lord, I just pray you use this time for your glory and honor. And I also pray, God, if anyone is listening who's not in that relationship with you yet through the power of the gospel, that Lord, today's the day 
that you open their eyes. Today is a day that they experience the power, the goodness, the beauty of your presence. And that, God, they would embrace you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. So, Lord, this is your time. Use it for your purpose and glory in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so let's just gonna, we're just going to dive right in. Again, if you have your app open to the sermon notes, and always encourage you to, to kind of follow along, take notes. Uh, so that way you can hopefully remember a little bit more if, if God specifically lays something on your heart. So the way that this passage starts off in chapter 4, verse 7, it says, The end of all things is near. What's he talking about? What is Peter referring to when he says, The end of all things? Well, if you, if you read on, we see several key phrases throughout the rest of this letter that gives us a clue what, what Peter means by the end. He's talking about the return of Christ, the end of, of this age, so to speak. He says the end of all things is near. He talks about uh, on down. Uh, we see in verse uh, 11, it says that Jesus Christ and everything, to him belong glory and power forever and ever. So there's a, a forever connotation if you go on down to verse 15 he says you may also rejoice with great joy at the revelation of his glory when christ reveals his glory at his return verse 17 says the time has come for the judgment again with god's household that shows we're again nearing this end on in chapter 5 which we hadn't read through yet but chapter 5 it talks about in verse uh in verse 1 to per we're participants in the glory about to be revealed that implies in Christ at his return. Verse 6, talking to the, the shepherds and elders, says when the chief shepherd appears, that's at his return. And so we end up the section, verse 11, how the dominion belongs to Christ forever and ever. So in context, this, this end that Peter is describing is the return of Christ. And so the, the key message here is, look, keep persevering victoriously in these seasons of affliction because the end is near. It is near times when Christ will return. And so it, it gives us that hope that just keep on a little bit longer. You know, hope is a powerful, it's a powerful truth. You know, we can be enduring some awful things. Humanity, individuals, has, they have endured horrific things in the past. But if we know that there's an end to that suffering, if we know that there's an end to that pain, it gives us hope and we can we're able to hold on and to persevere just a little bit longer. So hopefully we're nearing the end of COVID-19. A lot of restlessness is going on because the hope seems to be, seems to be imminent. And so we're, re we're, ready, we're just chomping at the bit to, to get back out, to get back to doing things, to getting back to what was a normal. Now, I'm not sure what that's going to look like in the future for normal, but there's just chomping at the bit to do that. That's because there's, so, there's hope. Right? So hope is a powerful truth. And so if we have the hope that the end of this suffering is near, right, it, it helps us to push on a little harder, a little more confidently, a, a little more res, uh, with more resolution uh, to, to do it well. And so that's the message Peter is telling us. So here's what he's, he's going to remind us of quite a few things. And so here he says, because the end is near, there's certain things believers will do or think or, or, or say. And so let's look at that. Because of the end is near, believers will, first of all, believers will share in the sufferings of Christ. If we know the end is near, if we know that just on the backside of this suffering, there's great things awaiting, we will suffer well. We will share in these sufferings of Christ. So here in verse chapter 4, verse 13, it's what Peter says. Uh, he says, uh, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of the Messiah. So we'll, we'll suffering, but as we suffer, he says rejoice. He says rejoice with great joy in these sufferings. Now that's, that seems, again, kind of uh, paradoxical. It seems counterintuitive that we would rejoice when we are suffering. Now again, the context here is suffering because of faith, right? So to the, to the believers Peter is writing to, he says, rejoice because you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Just the way Christ was persecuted, you are being persecuted. So rejoice at your suffering. Rejoice that you are bearing the name of Christ. So although there's not a 100% direct application to suffering COVID-19 or in this pandemic or isolation, there are definitely some applications. Because as we suffer in general, right, it gives us that opportunity 
to better identify with Christ who suffered for us. And so rejoice with great joy. There's a lot of scriptures that, that fits this, that, that applies to this. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rejoice always. So regardless of circumstances, we are to rejoice because we have a Savior. We have the Lord, and we cannot lose with Him. There's going to be tough times, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's persecution, whether it's conflict in, in the family, whether it's, uh, you know, being disciplined for something or having to discipline your children for something, whatever the conflict, whatever the problem is, it's okay. Rejoice because ultimately we win. We have a no-lose guarantee. So rejoice. You know, James chapter 1 talks about rejoice in various kinds of trials or consider it joy as you go through various kinds of trials. Well, COVID is a one of many kinds of trials. So we're to consider this joy, understanding we are saved. We have the Lord, and He has promised to return and complete what He has started. Also, believers will see the glory of Christ. Now, I don't know if, how often you think about these things, but for us, you know, our, our faith is just that. It, it's faith. We don't have a visual of exactly what Jesus looks like or, or what does it look like for Jesus to be in His glory you know, we read passages like out of, out of Chronicles. I love the passage uh, in, in 2 Chronicles 7 where it talks about how Solomon just completes the temple. And he, and he prays and all the people are gathered together to, to celebrate the completion of the temple of the one true God. And so Solomon prays. And at the end of his prayer, he really invites God to, to, to let his glory come. And it says as soon as he prays, that God filled the temple with his glory. So much so that the priests that were there, they were, it seemed everybody was driven to the pavement with their face to the ground, prostrate before the Lord God himself, whose glory now filled the temple. And they responded by beginning to sing, you are good, you are good, and your love endures forever. I mean, what a powerful moment to see the glory of the Lord fill the temple. For us, we're left to our imagination, a sanctified imagination, but to imagine what that looks like. Or you fast forward to Revelation chapter 1, where the Apostle John is, is exiled on the island of Patmos, and Jesus appears to him. You know, not like Jesus had looked when he walked among us for three years, but the glorified Jesus, how John describes him as his hair was bright, shining like the sun, is like wool and eyes of, of just brilliant lights gazing um, he had the purple sash and he just described the glorified Christ again his images help us but one day as we talk about and sing about and read about our faith will be sight when Christ returns we will see him we will behold him as he truly is and it's I, I firmly believe that my mind at this stage, cannot fully comprehend what that sight is going to be and how powerful, how majestic, how awe-inspiring that moment's going to be when we behold the glory of the risen, glorified Son of God. We will, as believers, we will see Him. We will see Him in His glory. And in that moment, all the suffering that we've endured is going to be so worth it. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. I do not consider that the sufferings of this age can even compare to the glory that will be revealed in Christ. Romans chapter 8. That is so true. So it makes all of our suffering worth it to be able to see and experience the beauty, the power, the majesty of that moment when Christ returns in glory. We will see that. Not only will we see it, but also over in chapter 5, uh, Peter says we will actually participate in the glory about to be revealed. We're partakers of it. We will benefit. We ourselves will be glorified. Again, back to Romans chapter 8, Paul writes about this, and he, and he kind of talks about the whole salvation process. You know, he starts in, in chapter 8, verse 28. He says, we know that God works all things together for the good of those who are the called according to Christ, who love Christ, who love God, right? Who are the called according to his purpose. And then he goes on and says, For those whom he foreknew, he did also predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those whom he uh, 
foreknew, he predestined, those he redestined, he called, those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he glorified. So here Paul looks at the entire salvation process from the beginning of time when God, you know, predestined, foreknew us to the end when we are glorified. We'll be partakers in the glorification of Christ. We ourselves will be glorified. What, is, what does that mean? That means we'll be transformed. No, that means that even though we may die, we will be risen. And our risen, our resurrected bodies will be glorified. They'll be greater. They'll be mightier. First, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 that we will be immortal, incorruptible. We'll be flawless. And we will be glorified as Christ. So we, we're partakers of that. So this is a great thing just to think through and talk through and study. And, and let your sanctified imagination run with that. What is it going to be like when we are in our glorified state with Christ forever? There'll be no more sin. I mean, just think about all the things that can stress us out. COVID-19, isolation, or when we made bad decisions and we suffer the consequences, or when we intentionally or unintentionally hurt someone else and the fallout from that, or when someone else intentionally or unintentionally hurt us and the fallout from that. I mean, our life is marred with sin. This is why we need a Savior. We can't defeat this on our own. We must have a Savior. We must have the Savior, Jesus Christ, who's the only one who can forgive us and cleanse us and begin to change us with that goal of the glorification, which is to be a beautiful, pure image of Christ. So let your mind run, run with that. How incredible is that going to be for us all to be in our glorified bodies? And if that wasn't enough, we also receive rewards. Look at what chapter 5, verse 4 says. Talking here specifically to the elders or shepherds or pastors of churches, but we're also going to see that there's other rewards uh, that's for everybody, right? But here he says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, that's what, all that, what does that all mean? You know, there's a lot of discussion about, is, it, is he really talking about an actual crown, or does this just mean in our glorified state? You know, it's an interesting study to go through and look at crowns. We're not going to do that now, but, you know, just uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, everyone who completes exercises, self, who competes, rather, exercises self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable one. So here, Paul is using the example of, of athletes who, who exercise, who practice, who compete in the Olympic Games. He says they do it to achieve to win this crown. And uh, that, that would be like the olive wreath around the head is a sign of a victory. But here, Paul says, but we, meaning believers, we compete. We run this race of life to receive an eternal, imperishable victory crown. So at some level, there's rewards involved for us who are believers, who follow Christ. And, uh, you know, when we, you know, I under, my understanding of Scripture is, you know, when all of us as believers die, we go and we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the Greek concept is the bema, the bema seat of Christ. And there we, we answer to Christ. But it's not so more for judgment of condemnation or not, because Romans 8 says there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But that judgment is kind of the effect of what have you done with the time I have given you, with the resources I've given you, with the gifts, which we're about to get into here in a minute, with the gifts I've given you. How did you leverage your life that I redeemed, that I saved for my glory? And we'll give an account for that, and based on that, we'll determine rewards. But I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm just still, I'm just so thankful just to be able to be in the kingdom of God. The rewards are all in my mind, that, that's, that's good and all, but I'm just glad to be a part of it. You know, just that I've been saved and rescued by the sheer grace of God. Nothing that I've done on my own. So, that's some of the things that believers, will, that will happen for us because the end is near. You know, we will share in the sufferings of Christ, but we will rejoice with great joy. Uh, we will see the glory of Christ, we'll participate in the glory of Christ, and we'll receive rewards here according to Peter. Now let's go back through and look at it from God's perspective. Because the end is near, here's some things God will do. First, you see, God will provide strength to believers using their gifts. 
So if you go back to chapter 4, he says, Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers or stewards of the varied grace of God. So here's the, the beautiful reality of what Peter's talking about. Paul teaches on this as well in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, is that the moment you are our saved, that moment in time when we trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when, you know, our eyes are open, we come to our senses, so to speak, and we recognize that God is holy and I'm sinful and there's no way I could ever earn favor from God, that Jesus has earned that for me. So by trusting in Christ as Lord and Savior, no, we're saved. The Bible says we're born again. And at that moment that we're saved, when we trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, the Bible also says we receive the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, He also gives us one or more gifts called spiritual gifts. Again, Romans 12 is a great chapter for this. 1 Corinthians 12 is a great chapter for this. Ephesians 4 contains some of this. Here, Peter mentions a few specific gifts that he uses as an example. He says, if anyone speaks... So preaching, teaching the Word of God, that is a spiritual gift. And so here, those who are, who are gifted to do this are called to do this um, from, you know, is to, to really speak God's words. So the caution here is if you have that gift to teach someone the Word of God, make sure you're teaching what God says, not what you want them to hear. And so this is a very applicable truth in our day and age when there are many, many preachers, teachers, who, you know, really don't teach the Word of God. They see kind of as a guide, but they wouldn't use terms like we use in Baptist life of inerrant, infallible. You know, we are completely committed to the authenticity, the historical accurateness, this, the uh, sufficiency of the Word of God. And so we submit ourselves to the authority of the Word of God because of that. That's a, a gift, spiritual gift of teaching and preaching the Word of God. He also talks about serving it says, if anyone serves, it should be from the strength that God provides. So here we see that God provides his strength to believers to use their gifts. The Bible talks about many other spiritual gifts. It talks about hospitality. It talks about knowledge, wisdom, leadership, administration. Uh, all of these are in the context of the, within the body of Christ. It talks about um, serving, helping, um, giving, even faith itself is a spiritual gift. So the Bible has a lot of examples of spiritual gifts, gifts that you and I receive the moment we're saved and receive the Holy Spirit. So all of you that have trusted in Christ are gifted in very specific ways. And this is all according to the varied grace of God. And here's where Paul helps us not go deeply into this, but Paul helps us understand that the Holy Spirit doesn't just randomly give you a gift. He gives you a gift with intentionality and strategy because he is building his church. So all of us are gifted for very particular purposes. And none of us, not a single person has all the gifts. And there's not one gift that everyone has. It's widely distributed so that we truly need each other to be the complete body of Christ that God has called us to be. That is why every single one of you are so important to the body of Christ. So God provides us strength to use that gift. Secondly, um, God will be glorified through our serving. That's our goal. our goal. Our goal in serving is not to impress other people. It's not to feel good about ourselves. It's not even to, to just to be a blessing to other people. Our ultimate goal for serving is the glory of God. So that should dictate how we serve. That should dictate our attitude in serving. So just meditate. However you're serving right now, are you serving truly for God's glory or are you serving for just because you think you should? Uh, are you serving because, simply because someone asked you to? Those are maybe good reasons to, to start serving. But once you're serving and growing in your serving, our ultimate passion should be for God's glory. Thirdly, God will rest his spirit upon us. It says here in chapter 4, verse 14, the context here, especially when we are suffering, it says, if you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit, of, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. God's presence rests 
upon us. When we are suffering, especially for his glory, his spirit rests upon us. He is always with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. Letter D, God will give grace to the humble. We get to chapter 5, and another promise that God will do as the end is drawing near, he will give grace to the humble. So a lot of teaching here about, about humility. Humility and following Christ go hand in hand. Um, arrogance, pride has no place in the follower of Jesus' life. But he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves, O for under the mighty hand of God. Grace to the humble. So humble yourselves. I mean, all of us would say in a heartbeat, yes, we want the grace of God. We want that favor from God. We want that unmerited favor. Well, if you want that unmerited favor from God, the only, there's only one way to get that, and that is humbling ourselves. Not bowing up in pride, not responding with pride, but responding with humility, receiving grace. Because then God will exalt the humble. This is very counter culture for us. You know, we live in a culture that says, exalt yourself, you know, look out for number one, um, you know, go get your own kind of a deal, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and it's all about you. This is, you know, a worldview called secular humanism, puts you and me in the middle of everything. That's the opposite of a biblical Christian worldview, which says put Christ in the middle of everything, the center of everything, not us. I love the, the example of John the Baptist. So, John the Baptist comes on the scene, and he's very unorthodox in how he preaches, and his message is very, um, very offensive, especially to, to, to the religious elite. But his message is repent, because the kingdom of God is now at hand. And he wore weird clothes, and he you know, didn't cut his hair. He was just a very unorthodox person. But he had an immense following, an immense following. People were coming to him out of the woodwork. The religious leaders, there was such a movement going on with John the Baptist that religious leaders were traveling miles just to hear him, to meet him, to, see, to listen to what he was saying. But then Jesus comes along. And for many, for many leaders, many religious leaders, even many pastors, you know, John, I'm sure John's ego was stroked. He was, he, was a, he was doing great things. There was a lot of people that came just to listen to his message. But here comes Jesus. And what is John's response? John 3, 30, he says, look, I must decrease so he may increase. He postured himself in a humble posture with Christ. And later, what does Christ say? Christ exalts him. He says, I tell you, there's not been a greater man born among women than John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist humbled himself, and Jesus Christ exalted John. So when we humble ourselves, God exalts us. That's the biblical way. The cultural way of today seems to be exalt yourself, but then we see we will be humbled. And so, so many great leaders exalt themselves, end up being humbled. That's true for, you know, military leaders, political leaders, spiritual leaders, Christian leaders. It's true across the board. Humility is key. But God will also restore you. He will restore you. If, you, if we go on on down uh, toward the end of, of this text, you go to uh, verse 10 of chapter 5. It says, Now the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will personally restore. God will personally restore us. That means restore us to the full image of Christ that was shattered because of sin. He will restore us. He will make us whole. He says he will also establish you. He will give us firm footing, firm foundation, the rock of Scripture, the rock of Christ. He is our firm foundation. He will establish us. He will strengthen us. You know, I've heard many people that have gone through persecution and suffering say, you know, before, before I got there, I always thought, I don't see any way I would be able to survive or, or stand up to the pressure of persecution. But he said, in that moment, God just gave me this supernatural strength. You know, I, I love to read biographies of, of believers who have gone in the past, you know, you know, people like William Tyndale, who was, who was burned at the stake because he was, had the strong conviction that the Bible should be able to be read by anyone in, our, in, in their language. So he translated the Bible into English, and he was burned at the stake for that. But when he was going up to, the, to, the, to be burned at the stake, he didn't waver. He did not cower. 
he was resolute in his conviction and he did not renounce what he believed about being saved by faith alone he did not renounce his conviction that the right thing to do is to give the bible into hands of every person who can read he was resolute in that he never wavered he had that supernatural strengthening from the spirit of god that's what god will do when we face suffering god gives us the strength we need to persevere for his glory he strengthens us and he will support us he will support us as the the church family is so critical we support one another you know i think in the american church things are pretty easy so we you know we you know we can tend to squabble and bicker over lesser things but when when really tough times happen whether it's death of a loved one whether it's a sickness whether it's a spiritual uh, calamity you really see the church rally around each other and support each other that's what we're called to do that's why the, there's such a beauty in this thing called the body of christ and then lastly number three because the engineers here's some here's some things believers should do first we should be clear-headed back up to chapter four verse seven the end of all things is near therefore be serious and disciplined or clear-headed that word serious it means clear-headed you know sober-minded I mean, we're, our, our mind's not filled with a lot of distracting garbage. Jesus is coming soon. That should clear our mind and help us to really focus on what's really important. Not all the sideline things, not all the lesser things. I think we've kind of seen that here in the COVID-19 days, especially in the, when it was pretty fresh and new. That was kind of something I heard a lot. You know, we, I, I really didn't know how much quality family time I was missing because we were just so busy I think this concept that priorities really are important and you know we need to we have to be intentional in what we prioritize or the urgent will crowd our calendar the urgency of you know all these other things we do hobbies and leisures and entertainments and you know going to this going to that the the crazy amount of sports we do you know there's not been sports for six seven eight weeks we're still alive you know now and the, you're talking to a sports fan i mean I, I played every kind of ball just about my life i love sports but it's it's okay you know thank i've enjoyed family time it just has reminded me that there's a lot more important things in life and so we've got to stay focused because christ is coming back when christ returns to get us he's not going to be nearly as interested in you know, if you were a great quarterback or a great hitter or pitcher, he's much more interested in, were you a great follower of Christ? Were you a great discipler of others? Were you a, a great at understanding and pouring into the Word? That's what matters to Christ. That's what should matter to us. Clear-headed, disciplined in prayer. Disciplined in prayer. A lot of times, again, we let the tyranny of the urgent crowd out our schedule. And I know I'm guilty of this. Get up, I'm worried about what I'm supposed to do today instead of just first being still before the Lord. Be disciplined in that prayer. Third, keep our love for one another at full strength. I love the way Peter says this in chapter 4, verse 8. It says, above all, maintain an intense love for each other. Some translations say, maintain your love at full strength. That's a powerful calling because in seasons of suffering, Things just get hard. You know, let's look around right now and there's, you could ask five different people, hey, what do you believe about the reality of COVID and reopening? And, you know, are some states being too easy on it? Are they being too strict on it? You're going to get five different opinions. Um, is this, from the one hand, you have those who are legitimately fearful that uh, this, epide- this pandemic could b- break wide open again any moment. And the other end, you got those that hold that this is all conspiracy theories and, you know, that sort of thing. But now's the time where love for each other has to be at full strength. There's got to be grace. There's got to be understanding, compassion with one another. Now, just on any, a lot of different issues that hit us. You know, we have different opinions. But still, love has to be at full strength without hypocrisy, Paul adds in Romans. So, love at full strength. Number four, letter D, be hospitable without complaining. He says, you know, hospitality, just in the craziness of our culture, is kind of becoming a lost art. We're not nearly as hospitable as we once were, um, just because there's just a lot of crazy things that happen. Um, but we're called, toward, especially towards believers, to be hospitable. 
understanding we are truly family. To use our giftedness for service to God and others. Kind of already talked about that, but that's, that's why the Spirit gives you the gift. It's not for your benefit, it's for His glory and the benefit of the church. Because the end is near. Let's leverage all what we can, all we can, for God's glory while we can. A letter F to glorify God in our suffering. Suffer well, chapter 4, verse 16. It says, if you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the glory of, and Spirit of God rest on you. Suffer well. Suffer for the glory of God. Be thankful. Even, and find that thanksgiving in every little detail. That's just, it just goes back to 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always. Be thankful to God in every circumstance. For this is God's will for your life in Christ Jesus. That glorifies the Lord. Clothe ourselves with humility towards one another. We talked about humility. It's inseparable from our relationship with Christ. And letter H, cast all of our cares upon him. I love this here. Verse, chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Um, it says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your care on him because he cares about you. There's nothing that happens in your life that you can't go to the Father about. Every little thing, every big thing. Why? Because he cares for you. If, whether it's you're praying for God to help you on a final exam. Some people say, does God really care about my final exam? Absolutely he cares about your final exam because God cares for you. You know, this praying before you go to the grocery store, God help me please get some toilet paper, right? Does God care about toilet paper? Absolutely, because God cares about you. So trust him. Cast all, it says cast all your cares upon him. Not just what you deem the big ones, but all of them. God loves you. God enjoys doing life with you. And the more of your life you intentionally bring God into, the more joyful, the closer you're going to be with the Lord. And that's what he wants. It's all about the relationship. A lot of times we look at God as just kind of a genie in the sky. And if we just say the right kind of prayer, put the right coins in, so to speak, we ask God what we want and he gives it to us. It's not the way it works. It's not about just the asking and getting. It's about the relationship involved in that process. He cares for you. And then be sober and alert. This is a warning here in verse 8. Be serious, be alert, be sober, because the devil is prowling like a roaring lion, looking to devour us. So be sober. I mean, again, clear-minded, alert. Know that any given moment can come a powerful temptation. And if we're not being sober, we're not being diligent, if we're not being alert and watchful, this is why daily prayer time and time in Scripture is so important. It helps us stay alert. We, you know, the en enemy can overcome us. And so we must be on guard and resist the devil. Resist him. Verse, verse 9, resist him and be firm in the faith. Resist those temptations. Again, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago, we've seen that in the season of COVID-19, Although a lot of good things have happened, there's been a lot of hard things that have happened. We see domestic violence dramatically increase. Um, last statistic I heard, Jefferson County saw a 43% increase in domestic violence cases as husbands and wives and kids and family are being, you know, stuck in the home together. We see that. What's going on? Well, we're tempted by our flesh. We're also tempted by the enemy to do things we, we shouldn't do. And so that temptation rises in times of suffering. So resist the devil. Resist him. Uh, James reminds us in James chapter 4, it says, Submit to God, re resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How do you get the enemy to leave you alone? You resist him. You, instead of listening to him, you turn to and listen to the Lord. And you trust in God. And that is standing firm in the faith rock solid and what does this mean stand firm in the faith as he as peter ends this up in verse 9 what does this mean what is this faith this faith is the gospel we are to stand firm in the gospel it's all about the gospel you know sometimes we we tell our kids you know the gospel is the abcs of christianity and we talk about admit believe and confess and you know it's 
Uh, we see that we do that in Vacation Bible School and Spark and that sort of thing. But really, the gospel is not just A, B, C. It's the A through Z of the Christian life. You know, the Apostle Paul in Galatians says, just as you came to know Christ, so continue to walk in him. Well, how did we come to know Christ? Through the gospel. So how are we to continue to walk with Christ? Through the gospel. It's a constant recognition of who Christ is and who am I. That's the gospel. Who is Christ? He's the Son of God who loved us so much that came to die for us, to die in our place, so that by us trusting in Him, we could have forgiveness of sin. We could then be brought back into a relationship with God that began at the fall back in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, that relationship with God was fractured. Isaiah 59 says, Your iniquity, which is a big word for sin, has separated you from God. So our sin, because of our sin, we are separated from God. Well, the gospel is God's plan of reconciling us back to himself, back into that relationship. See, just because we're human doesn't mean we automatically have a relationship with God. We're born sinners. Paul says you are dead in your sins. We're born spiritually dead. No relationship with God. Only through Christ can we be born again. It means born spiritually where we can have that relationship with God through Christ. That's the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of the universe, who voluntarily came to live a sinless life that we couldn't live, and he voluntarily died on the cross, the death that we deserve, and he rose again from the grave, conquering sin, conquering death, conquering all of the consequences of the fall. And ultimately, he will return again. The end is near. He will return where the consummation, the completion of everything he's done will come to pass. That's the gospel. And we benefit from the gospel by having that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, being forgiven of all, just say that out loud, all, all of our sin, the little white lies and the big ones. We are forgiven all of that when we trust in Jesus Christ through the power of the gospel. That's why Paul says in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for all. Again, just say all. For all who believe, first for the Jew and also for the Greek, meaning everyone, all ethne, all races, the gospel. Have you trusted in Christ? Because if you haven't, then this suffering will only continue, right? This suffering is, well, you don't have that hope that believers have in times of suffering. Because you don't have a salvation to remember. You don't have a calling that you've rec you realized yet. You don't have a Savior yet. And the Lord's promise is, is not hopeful for you it would be terrifying because that's kind of where the bible goes into when we're talking about the return of christ it's hopeful for believers but it's going to be terrifying for non-believers do you have the hope of jesus christ in your life today through believing in the gospel if not i would love for you to reach out i'd love to talk and pray with you you can just email me at info at CanaanSTL.org. I would love to talk and pray with you through that because there is no greater moment in your whole life than when you first meet Jesus Christ through being saved, through confessing He is Lord, through um, repenting of sin, which means you give it all over to Jesus and He saves you. So let's pray together. And um, if you've never trusted in Christ, what a great time to do this. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Jesus, thank you that you loved us so much that you came. You left your heavenly throne and you came to earth as one of us. You lived amongst us as sinners. You, you witnessed, experienced this, some of the pain and consequences death can cause. You experienced death of loved ones. You experienced sickness all around you. You saw the depravity of mankind. Lord, you walked among us. You saw you saw it all. You felt the temptations we feel. Yet, Lord, you remained without sin. Jesus, thank you for that great sacrifice. But, but then, Jesus, you took it to the next step. You went to the cross for us. 
Not only did you live a sinless life that we can't live, you died the death that sin demands so that we wouldn't have to die that kind of death. Lord, you bore our sin. You, you took on the wrath, the justice of God that our sin deserves so that we can be freed from that. And Lord, you died. You experienced the sting of death. But praise you, Jesus, you didn't stay dead. Of your own power as God the Son, you rose again from the grave and you are alive. You conquered and shattered death. You disarmed the enemy. You disarmed the power of darkness against us. You proved yourself as truly the king of all kings, the king of the universe. And now you, you call us, you summon us to follow you, to trust in you. And Lord, I just want to pray right now, if there is anyone who is engaged in this prayer, that Lord, and they're not saved yet, they have not trusted in you yet, that Lord, this be that moment that they answer your call, that they hear you calling them, they, and they respond with faith. Jesus, I believe, I trust in you. Jesus, I cannot conquer death, I can't conquer sin, I have no hope of everlasting life apart from you. So Jesus, save me. Lord, I want to be a part of your family, a part of your kingdom. So Lord, I, I commit now to, to change, to repent of my sin, and to turn and follow you in all areas of my life. So Lord, save me. Give me your spirit. Begin to change me so I can be the man or the woman you've created me to be. So Lord, I just pray you've heard that prayer in the hearts of many. You've answered it through saving them. And God, I pray for those that are also saved already, who are just feeling some sting of the suffering, that God, you would increase our hope, increase our, our realistic expectation that the end, your coming, is near. And help us to live accordingly. Father, we love you. We just commend all this to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being here again. If you've trusted in Christ, you need to tell someone. So send me an email, info at canaanstl.org. Love to hear from you about that. Um, well, as we kind of come to a close of this series, uh, next Sunday, uh, we'll be, again, we'll be, so hopefully many of you will be here. We'll be starting a new series going back to the Gospel of John. And we're looking at the seven I am statements from Jesus uh, where Jesus teaches us more about who he is through his I am statements. We really want to focus on Jesus, going to keep focusing on Jesus. So uh, love all of you. Thank you for coming out yesterday for um, just the dropping off the, the goods and items that our ministry partners need. Feed My People, Oasis, and Hand in Hand Pregnancy Center. Um, they are doing great gospel ministry in our local area thanks to you and your partnership uh, with them. So thanks for your faithfulness there. Um, have a great week. Don't forget uh, this afternoon, 4 o'clock, we are having a church business meeting. I talk about another partnership opportunity with Victory Christian Academy. Uh, so be here for that at 4 p.m. online. It'll be on, online at, with the Zoom uh, function. So pray for that. That's, you know, it's kind of a, a new thing for all of us to have a business meeting through Zoom. So we'll see how that goes. It should be interesting. But have a great rest of the day, great week, and uh, hopefully we'll see a lot of you here next Sunday. God bless. As followers of Jesus, giving is an act of obedience and worship. So therefore, we've set up four ways for you to give. Uh, you can give online at canaanstl.org forward slash give. You can give through our Canaan STL app. Uh, you can give in person uh, by bringing it to the drop box located on the west entrance over by the child check-in. And finally, you can text um, the word GIVE to 314-648-2951 and just follow the instructions that are given there. Well, thank you for joining us this week. Don't forget that you can reach out to others by hitting the share button below and inviting them to join us this week. Uh, have a great week with God. We will see you soon.